Hi everyone, it is Willow from Willow's Web Astrology and I'm here today to do a little update on my recovery from fluoroquinolone antibiotic poisoning. It's been about a year, just, just over a year since I last did an update and I've actually had some exciting progress to report uh, in my recovery process. Uh, I was poisoned by Cipro, uh, three pills, three pills of Cipro in, uh, on uh, basically on December, in December, 2008, sorry. I'm coming up on, uh, sorry, no, December, 2009, Ugh, December, 2009. I'm coming up on the 10 year anniversary of being poisoned by Cipro. Um, and I will say that I had what I would call the severe end of a medium reaction. That's the kind of reaction that I had. Um, now, the most severe reactions that you can have are death from taking fluoroquinolone antibiotics. Uh, the most severe reactions you can have are being in horrendous chronic pain that leaves you bedridden or wheelchair bound. Yeah, those are, those are the kind of reactions, those are the kind of uh, lives that people are being sort of forced into because this drug has been left on the market without proper regulation for 30 years now. Okay, um, the labels were changed on fluoroquinolone antibiotics in 2016 in the States and 2017 in Canada to say that they should never be used as a first line antibiotic for minor infections because they are far too dangerous and that basically that safe, all safer alternatives should be tried first. Uh, but that is exactly how fluoroquinolones have been prescribed. Uh, over the past 30 years and they continue to be prescribed like that. So the labels have changed. The information on those labels has not trickled down to, um, you know, to the doctors who are prescribing them, to the pharmacists who are dispensing them or to the people who are putting them in their mouths for minor infections. It's basically like Russian roulette. It's like playing Russian roulette with your, with your life, with your health, with your body, everything. Um, so, I've done extensive videos on this. I've written on my blog extensively about this. So I won't go into the, you know, the full uh, set of symptoms that I had, um, the, you know, the full scenario or the, the socio-political work that I've done. Um, I've been doing my own journalistic work, independent journalism on this topic, on iatrogenic illnesses and deaths on the pharmaceuticals industry, on particular Bayer, and now Bayer Monsanto. Um, it's really funny because I was always, I was a, a, an anti-GMO writer and journalist, and I was also a pharmaceuticals vigilance writer and activist, and those two worlds just came together <laughs> with the Bayer Monsanto merger. Um, so I, I've done extensive work on all of this. Um, I've written a zine, which I've written two zines actually, uh, Nightmarish Tales of the Pharmaceutical Industry's Crimes Against Humanity, volume one and, volumes one and two. Uh, and they're, they're available on Etsy if anyone would like to, to buy them. And I just got a five-star review for one of, these re one of these zines with a really exciting bit of feedback, which was um, the person said that this is a super important zine and I can't wait to share it with my health sciences students. And that's really great because one of the major areas that need that we need to be working on is educating people in the healthcare field and in particular students and their instructors, right? Because like I say, the dangers of these drugs, the, the full extent of the damage that these drugs have done um, and the, the, the continuing practice of prescribing them and dispensing them as first line antibiotics for minor infections, that continues to this day. So people are being hurt and killed and put in a state of long-term debilitation or even disability uh, for no reason. You know, they, there was never any reason for it, but now even the labels on them say, there are four, count them, four black box warnings on Cipro. Um, Cipro is one of the most popular name brands, but there's also Levaquin, Avalox, Floxin, Noroxin, a number of, of name brands. There's also a number of generic brands and it'll generally have the word flox, the, the, the little kind of root word flox in any of the names. And these have been infused with fluorine, which is a known neurotoxin, which basically creates systemic poisoning. Now I'm sure it's not just the fluorine in these drugs that's causing the problems. Um, but basically 
yeah, uh, severe tendon and connective tissue damage, um, di severe digestive damage, uh, blood sugar issues, prediabetes. Um, uh, what else is going on here? Or well, just straight up organ damage, organ damage, aortic dissection, um, uh, severe suicidal thinking and um, morbid thinking, chemical depression, chronic fatigue, just crushing chronic fatigue. You know, the list goes on. Tinnitus, vision damage. You know, it really does. It, it, there's there's a list of probably. 40 or 50 symptoms that belongs to a syndrome created by these drugs called fluoroquinolone antibiotic toxicity syndrome. And so, okay, so this video is about uh, the progress in my recovery. I'm, I'm not going to, you know, it, it's hard not to get into the really hardcore stuff with this topic because there's just so much information that it needs to be out there needs to be circulating needs to be getting to certain people's ears and eyes and brains right um but uh the the recovery process for me from this kind of medium severe reaction that i had has been very long it's it's been 10 years that it's taken me this long and um i've just kind of come to realize that i most likely have a permanent mild disability from it i i don't believe that i will ever be back to normal. Um, but I found ways to manage my symptoms so that I'm honestly pretty functional, pretty darn functional. And even people who, who don't know me, uh, might not even, you know, might not even think there's anything awry with me. Right. Um, so one of the things that, that, uh, recently happened that was a sign of you know, sign of progress was that I was able to work at my casual job uh, for a two month stint. It was a month and then a week off and then another month. Uh, and this was, I was working at a book, a college bookstore during a renovation process and it was just me. I basically had to put the whole store back together by myself and uh, with a little bit of help, but very, not very much. And so it was a lot of moving boxes and packing boxes and unpacking boxes and lifting and moving and a lot of physical labor, right? And even uh, probably a year and a half, two years ago, there's no way that I would have been able to do this um, because I had relapsed myself, unfortunately, by drinking uh, chlorinated tap water <laughs> and I was in a mess. I, I was having some of the worst symptoms I'd ever had um, you know, and that was like eight years in. So that was miserable. The, the thing that saved me was this Berkey water filter, Berkey, um, that that's and acupuncture and also reducing my carbs and sugars extensively. Um, but the, the good news is, so I, I went into this stint and I, I honestly didn't know that if I was going to be able to do it because I, I work from home. I am an astrologer and writer. And luckily I've always been able to make, uh, you know, a decent amount of income that way, but I always need supplemental, um, supplemental work as well. And it's really difficult to find work where you're in control of the hours that you're doing, right? Because there are times when I literally just cannot, I can't physically do it. My tendons are you know, stiff and sore and I'm just creaking around or I'm just incredibly fatigued or, um, you know, I'm having blood sugar issues and I'm passing out after eating. Like there's, you know, there, there's, a, there's a lot to this whole, uh, to this syndrome and to this recovery process. So I have, um, a couple of casual jobs. So I can basically say yes or no to the work. So I said yes to this stint and it started off just being a, like two weeks. And I was like, Oh, okay, well I've done two weeks there before. So I think I'll be okay. So I did the two weeks. And then it just kept getting extended week by week. And, and I, I was nervous. I was nervous, you know, but I, I just kept accepting the work and I thought, well, you know, if worse comes to worse, I'll just have to say, you know, I'm fried. I can't, can't do this. Um, so luckily I had a month and it was kind of the heaviest labor work, a month of like, like fairly intensive moving stuff around. Then I had a week off, which you normally don't get in a, in a regular job. Right. And that helped substantially. And then I had another month. Uh, and I will say that by the end of that month, I was done. By the end of the second month, I couldn't have done one more day. I was absolutely 
at the end of my energy, my tendons were giving out. I was just like, that's, that's the end of it. But I did it, you know, that that's really celebratory because I, like I said, I would not have been able to do that. Um, probably in any, any, I, yeah, really any of the previous years. So this is the first year. And like I said, I'm heading into my 10, 10 year anniversary. This is the first year that I could say, yeah, I've recovered enough that I can do this. So I just want to give you guys this information, um, to say, please don't give up. Okay. Please don't give up. I know how difficult this is. I, I was in absolute hell for at least three years and then moderate hell for another probably five years, uh, six years, you know, um, even now it's still, I mean, it, it's still really difficult to manage this on a daily basis. It's really difficult to manage the diet, the water, the amount of rest that you need, all of this type of stuff. But I'm just here to say that even after a substantial amount of time, you know, just keep fighting, keep trying different things. And, um, you know, and, and eventually I hope what will help for what will happen for everyone is that something will dig in, something will work. Okay. And so for me, I, like I said, the Berkey water filter was huge. So when I first moved to this new area, I started drinking the tap water. I don't know why. And I had been drinking reverse osmosis or spring water pre prior to that. So I don't know, you know, I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, and it just walloped me. It, it, it relapsed me worse than I'd ever been. My back was going out, um, and dropping me to my knees. I couldn't ride the city bus without my back going out and I'd be stuck in the seat with my back going out and I couldn't even get like, I, I'd have to wait for 30 seconds to even get up, to get off the bus. Um, walking to the grocery store and back, it was like a mirror. I had to rest in between, you know, I, it's maybe a 12 minute walk to the grocery store. I had to, I had to rest in between, you know, it, it was, it was not good, but it was primarily the water. It was also that I was eating, uh, beans. I was eating beans regularly and that turned out to be a trigger food for me. So the thing that, um, the thing about this, uh, situation is everybody's body's different. Okay. So I'm not, I'm just telling you what's worked for me and you can take it or leave it. But what's worked for me is a very restricted diet. Okay. So my diet consists of vegetables, uh, with very few potatoes. Uh, so because p potatoes are too starchy, uh, so vegetables, um, beef and chicken that is up to organic standards, organic eggs, nuts, and a little bit of low glycemic fruit and low glycemic fruits are like granny Smith apples, uh, probably crab apples. I'm not sure what the sugar content is there, but they're kind of tart and berries. Those are the low, low like, uh, and lemons and limes. Those are the low glycemics. Um, so, and that's it. That's it. I, I had to cut out dairy and grains because they started giving me cellulitis infections on my face which is like a skin infection that spreads. It's like this bright red, hot infection that spreads on your face. And uh, I had to get antibiotics to get rid of them, which of course I want to avoid antibiotics like the absolute plague. Um, but, but for me, primarily it's been diet and water and rest combined with gentle exercise and like getting sunshine, stuff like that. So I haven't gone too hardcore on the supplements. Other people have and other people swear by it. Um, I've tried magnesium. I've tried, uh, probiotics. I've tried, um, uh, what else have I tried? Oh, honestly, I've tried a laundry list of them and often I would have bad reactions to them. So just because my system was so sensitized, right? It just couldn't even, couldn't even take an extra, an extra, you know, anything, an extra vitamin or anything. Um, so yeah, so I do use uh, magnesium oil occasionally. Um, but the primary thing has been diet, uh, clean water and, um, uh, rest, gentle exercise, I, walking, gardening, yoga, swimming, things like that. Uh, acupuncture has helped me. And like I say, cannabis use, medicinal cannabis use has helped with the suicidal and morbid thinking that was you know, being created by this chem, you know, this chemical reaction, this chemical psychosis, whatever you want to call it. 
that was caused by the drug. And that can last for years. And that did last for years. I had, I had intense suicidal and morbid thinking as well as a, just kind of an all pervasive sense of dread that was just sitting on me all the time. Never, never let up for, I would say three to four years. And then I tried medicinal cannabis. And luckily for me, that that's what, what broke me out of it. That's what helped. That's what changed the chemistry in my brain so that I could feel any sense of well-being at all because I didn't feel any sense of well-being at all for four years. I was in chronic pain for four years, um, at least four years. Const, almost constant headache, almost constant pressure in my head, almost constant tendon pain and dysfunction, almost constant crushing fatigue, like barely making it through, like, you know, just your, your d basic daily routine was too much. Anyway, so, um, the other thing about the diet, so, so I, yeah, so the things that I've cut out of my diet, that's, that's maybe more applicable are dairy and grains. And again, that's strictly for me because of the cellulitis infections. Okay. Uh, soy, I don't, don't eat soy. I don't eat any processed foods other than, um, I will, I will give myself as a treat, um, organic, uh, sorry, organic tortilla chips, corn, just corn, like purely corn. They're very starchy to you though. So just occasional and, um, kettle, kettle chips and like the non GMO kettle, kettle, plain kettle chips, no seasoning on them or anything. Um, but, but other than that, no processed food, no refined sugar, um, no conventional meat or farm seafood. Um, and I'm actually on no beans legumes as well because they started causing problems for me. So, you know, again, you have to work with your diet on your own. It's, it's, you know, it's something that you, <clears throat> that you'll have to tailor to yourself. But I will say that the, that, uh, elimination diets temporarily, maybe only, uh, maybe permanent, uh, definitely helped me. So gauging my body's reaction to certain foods and then cutting it out for a time to see how my body did. And unfortunately for me, I had to cut out, uh, many, many different foods. Um, I had from the fluoroquinolone, fluoroquinolone poisoning, I ended up with candida, which is a yeast overgrowth, which is a common thing related to antibiotics. Uh, it's a common thing because it just really screws up your, your gut health, your, the good bacteria in your body, uh, you know, the balance, all that kind of thing. Um, so I had to uh, do a kind of a, and I also had blood sugar issues. So like I say, the, the, the black box warning about the blood sugar issues, that's also something that affects me. So I will sometimes eat and then fall asleep for four hours, you know? And it's like, there is, I'm not eating anything different than what I normally eat. It's just, again, just these crazy blood sugar issues. Um, so I'm on a very sugar reduced diet. Now I reduced my sugars too much. And then I started having problem, hormone problems. My period stopped. I was like chronically exhausted. I was feeling cold all the time. So it's, you know, it's a, it, you're playing with it. You're, you're working with it. You're experimenting with it. Um, so I'm not on a, I'm not on a low carb. I'm on a, I would say moderate, low, moderate carb diet. So my carbs generally are like granny Smith apples and berries, uh, potatoes and, um, sometimes I have no cheese nachos, right. On organic corn, corn chips. So that's my, that's my fun. Um, but okay. So back to the trigger substances. So there are certain substances that will often trigger reactions. Okay. Bad reactions. So pain, fatigue, uh, just feeling ill and gross and not good or whatever symptoms you have, it'll stir those symptoms up again. Right. Uh, and caffeine is one of those, uh, caffeine. Oh, that's, you know, I don't mind cutting out alcohol. I don't mind cutting out sugar, like refined sugar. None of these things have really bothered me. Cutting out bread and cheese was horrifically hard and still is, but, um, cutting out coffee. I love coffee and I was never a crazy coffee drinker, but I was like a cup a day, two cups a day, maybe if I was feeling crazy kind of coffee drinker. And so cutting caffeine out was, was quite hard at, you know, at the beginning. Um, and so, uh, previously I had tried to bring coffee back in and I was doing okay, but I noticed a lot of tendon problems, a lot of tendon pain, tendon sniffness. I was injuring myself 
a lot easier than normal. Um, and then I drank kind of a lower grade, lower quality. I had been drinking, you know, the fancy coffee, the beans that, you know, the good quality beans that you grind yourself and yada, yada, coffee snob type stuff, type stuff. Uh, but then I drank just kind of a, a random kind of lower grade cup of coffee and it completely relapsed me, like completely. So I was like, okay, coffee's out, coffee's out. But uh, because, because I had this um, two month job, you know, and the work world runs on coffee, let's just put it that way. They expect you to produce to a level that isn't even really natural for human beings. So you have to pretty much have some kind of a stimulant. I mean, you don't have to, but it definitely helps, right? Uh, I also had other stressful things going on in my personal life this summer. So just the whole heaping helping of it. Uh, there was also a there was also a coffee shop that opened up with super high grade, really delicious coffee just down the street, like less than a five minute walk from my house. So this all it was all kind of the perfect storm to get me drinking coffee again. And so I started off slowly. I started off just drinking like. A literal cup like 250 mils and just seeing like okay you know and that might even be too much for some people like when I first integrated it I would just have a few sips and see how that was and then work up from there uh, but so this summer I got to where I was drinking coffee every day and I didn't want to I didn't like doing that but I just kind of you know, it gets to be a habit. It's a pleasurable thing. It gives you energy. It gives you a sense of well-being. I mean, it just makes you feel all warm and fuzzy. It's a sociable thing. So when you're, um, you know, when you're sick for a long time, and also the the profession that I have, a writer and astrologer, you're alone a lot of the time, right? And so coffee is one of those things where, you know, it gets you out among people and you're chit chatting, and it's just, you know, it's a feel good kind of thing. But it absolutely is a drug. <laughs> for anyone who doesn't think that caffeine's a drug. Oh, it, it's absolutely drug. All you have to do is stop drinking it for four years like I did and then drink a cup and woo -hoo -hoo -hoo, oh goodness, you'll be, you'll be in the stratosphere. Um, so I've learned a few things about coffee in general and I think that this, these can probably apply to uh, all the trigger substances or a lot of them, right? Like in particular alcohol or like sugar, stuff like that. Okay, so um, what I found was that I could drink coffee up to a certain point and then it would start giving me symptoms. So then I would start having, ten in particular, it was the tendon issues, the tendon pain and stiffness, uh, fatigue, like even though it was a, a stimulant, it was making me fatigued. And that was like the adrenal burnout, the adrenal fatigue that's caused by, you know, constantly overstimulating your adrenals with a substance. Um, I would start getting dark circles under my eyes. I still kind of have dark circles under my eyes from it a little bit. Uh, there, and then if it was really bad, it would start getting puffy, especially under one of my eyes for some reason, under the left one, uh, start getting puffy. And then if I ignored that and kept drinking coffee and I would say I wasn't drinking a ton of coffee a day. I was usually just drinking a large cup per day but I would start getting the telltale skin eruptions where I would start being terrified that I was gonna get cellulitis. So then I would, I would be like, whoa, 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 okay, hold off sister, put on the brakes here. Um, so then I, you know, I started thinking like, okay, well, do I need to completely cut this out or can I have a little bit here and there? Now the difficult thing with something like caffeine is that it is hard to have it just occasionally, <laughs> you know, especially when you're so limited in your diet in other respects. Like my diet is so scaled back that like most people would just be like, how do you live like that? I mean, I don't know, it's hard, believe me. Um, you just kind of get into a grind with it, right? Okay, salad for supper for the next two weeks. Um, but but with caffeine, it's difficult because it, it is habit forming and it is addictive, right? Potentially addictive. You, you get used to that high, you get used to that sense of well-being and you can get reliant on it, right? Uh, so what I started doing was I started mixing like basically coffee days with no coffee days. Um, and I don't have the perfect formula. I think it just kind of shifts but at least one day with coffee, one day without coffee, one day with coffee, one day without coffee. Um, or if I had it a few days in a row, like because you know I was busy or I was stressed or I was just looking for that outlet, I would have it maybe for three days in a row and then I'd go like two days without it, right? Um, and then have it like two days and then 
one day without it. You know, just, just throw in some days where you're not having it because that gives your body an extra time to, to process it, right? And to let, to let go of it. Now, the thing that happens when you are poisoned by one of these pharmaceuticals is that your, livers and, your liver and your kidney are stre- kidneys are stressed, okay? Because they, they've been processing all these damaged cells. Um, they're, they're potentially damaged just from the, the drug itself. Your body's really sensitized to everything and you're gonna have weird, you know, potentially have weird reactions to everything. And so what I found is that I need a little bit of extra processing time to get the caffeine out of my system. Um, I also, like I say, uh, found that it has an even more intense effect now than before I was poisoned by um, fluoroquinolones because, or, you know, I'm sure because of that, again, that detoxification process that is just a little bit hampered, a little bit sluggish, just just overtaxed, right? It's literally just overtaxed in our bodies um, because our bodies are always struggling, struggling, struggling to to deal with the damage that's been done. So when I would have a cup of coffee, like I said, it would kind of, you know, at, at the beginning, I kind of got used to it, but it would, at the beginning, I would just be flying high. <laughs> uh, definitely the drug side of the caffeine was coming out. And so it definitely affected my body to a more intense degree. There's that joke, um, you know, it's always kind of funny the way older people will say, oh, I can't have any caffeine past, you know, 3 p.m. or I'll, I won't sleep at night. I don't think I could have caffeine probably past like about noon or one o'clock <laughs> without sleep and not have it hamper my sleep because it it's just that, you know, that intense of an effect and that it takes that long to process it out of uh, my body. So... My feeling is that at okay, so at a certain point in in my most acute years, I couldn't have any coffee because it would have just it would have just relapsed me. It would have made my life miserable, right? But after a few years of my process of of my recovery process, um, I was able to integrate a little bit. But then again, it has to be very high quality. Okay, so high quality coffee, um, and really you know, frankly, you should be using filtered water to drink it, you know, to, to make it, uh, at your own home. But if you're, if you're getting it at a cafe, that's most likely not going to be the, the situation. Um, so my feeling is that, you know, possibly all of these trigger substances, alcohol, sugar, processed foods, et cetera, et cetera, could be enjoyed in moderation as long as it doesn't become daily and as long as it doesn't become habitual. And this is of course only for people who have problems, right? Like if you're feeling fine and you you can have a beer or two every night, then have at her. Like that's, you're not the people I'm talking to with this video, right? I'm, al- I'm already foreseeing the hate mail and the friggin' comments about telling people to limit their alcohol. <laughs> Don't mess with people's alcohol, okay? <laughs> Um, so, and, and also I find medicinal cannabis is the same thing. It's, it's, it re- it alleviates a lot of my symptoms. Um, it alleviates the, well, pain for one thing. Uh, also any type of kind of dread or anxiety that I may have still, um, kicking around. Uh, the more, the morbid and suicidal thinking has, uh, lifted. Thank goodness. Um, but cannabis as well can get to be a little bit of a habitual thing. Right, and it it also, you know, people say there isn't any extra stress put on your organs, but that's not true. There is. Um, so, and I've I've had uh, liver related symptoms from having uh, from using cannabis too regularly as well. So that's another thing that I think you have to mi- kind of mix um, either days where you're not imbibing with days that you are, or kind of have little stretches, right? Like have a stretch where you're having a little bit every day and then go a period where you're not, you know, th- that, that kind of thing. So that's what I would suggest. I'm not, if, if you need it every day and you're not functioning every day and you want to end your time on earth without it, then, you know, please just disregard what I'm saying. But this is what would be, I think, easiest on the body, easiest on an already stressed and taxed system. Um, uh, yeah, and like I say, um, you can expect a stronger effect just because your body's so so sensitized, because your liver and kidneys are stressed. Um, 
and yes, just it just takes longer to eliminate those things, longer to um, to process those things. So, um, yeah, that is about the the those are the points that I wanted to make about tr trigger substances and you know, how you can sort of experiment with it at a certain point, right? Like I said, I, when I was in my worst state, state, um, I had one cup of coffee and it just walloped me. Absolutely. There was no way I would have touched that. Right. I was even scared to try it. Like, I think I tried it four years. I didn't, I didn't have it for about four years. And then I was dating someone who had, who had really high, drank really high quality French press coffee. And it was just, it just smelled so delicious. And I was around it all the time that I thought, okay, I'm going to, I'm just going to try a couple sips and that was okay. So then I tried, you know, then I tried half a cup and then I tried a cup and you know, I just kind of worked up like that. But like I said, it became, it became too habitual. I started having it every day. And then I had that cup of like lower grade coffee and that completely relapsed me. So then it went another four years, no coffee. And honestly, I find it easier to just cut something out completely and almost just like forget it exists and like shift your life to that, to it not being in your life, than to have it occasionally. I don't, I don't know, it's hard. It's um, when you're on a super restricted diet and you can, uh, you can find out that you can allow yourself something new it's, you know, it's hard not to go overboard with it. So uh, I've been kind of kicking myself about going overboard with, with these types of things. But, uh, you know, I would say you, we've already been through so much <laughs> that we don't, we don't need to be harsh on ourselves about having an extra cup of coffee here and there, or, you know, an extra beer, or whatever your little indulgence is, right? Um, ultimately, we didn't ask for this to happen to us. And we wouldn't have chosen this if we you know had had our druthers so yeah you know we can we can just kind of play with it a little bit and i think you know as long as you're uh, monitoring yourself right and you're not just kind of going on autopilot and just drinking coffee every day i drink coffee every day i drink coffee every day and it's easy to do that especially if you're working in the mainstream workforce right because that's just kind of built into the day um but you can't do that, or I can't do that anyway. Uh, and I, I think you can't do that if, um, you know, if it's going to cause you problems, if it's going to cause you increased pain or increased, you know, digestive issues or increased adrenal fatigue is a real thing. And um, I think when our bodies are under so have been under so much chemical stress for so long, the adrenals are kind of like taxed, you know, they're kind of at the end of what they can tolerate. So just monitor what you think your body can handle as far as these trigger substances. Um, and then again, mix in days where you're just letting your body detox, you know, and you're, you're eating really clean, eating really simple, also known as boring. Um, but <laughs> you know, you're, you're allowing, you're allowing these, these elimination pathways to, uh, to kick into gear. Anyway, um, I just want to say to everyone that, um, you know, I'm so pleasantly surprised that I was able to do that two months stint at work. Uh, it's just really, really wonderful, you know, that, that that was able to to happen. It's really wonderful that I'm even able to have any coffee at all because, you know, for, for so long I wasn't able to. Um, so, you know, focus on the little, the little, you know, celebrations, the little victories. Um, and I hope that you all will have those kind of sustaining victories throughout your recovery process as well. Um, please hang in there. Please keep fighting. Please keep trying. Please keep trying different things to help to improve your health. Um, invest in your health. You know, if you think you can't afford it, you know, please ask a family member for help. Ask, you know, a spouse or sibling or, you know, whatever, you know, just get the things that you need um, to make yourself better. And, uh, yeah, I, uh, I wish you all a quick and speedy recovery, but if you don't have a quick and speedy recovery, just know that even 10 years in like me, you can still be making dramatic progress. Um, I don't know why sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you have a, you know, it, it's a very crazy, crazy, crazy recovery process. And, I'm sure I'll have periods where I'm, you know, where I'm not feeling as great as I'm feeling now. 
Um, but just know that, you know, it, it, it pays off to stick with it. Okay. Okay. Sorry. One little addition to the video, uh, that I forgot to mention is how very important it is to stay alkaline, to alkalize your body. Uh, especially if you have candida issues or uh, tendon problems, inflammation, um, arthritic issues, alkalizing your body is key, okay? And especially if you're drinking substances like coffee, alcohol, if you're eating any refined sugar, if you're eating a lot of meat, um, if you're eating processed foods, all these things make the body acidic. And so you want to be... Uh, bringing in as much alkaline as possible to balance that out. When I was drinking coffee, I was, I was pounding tons of lemon water, okay? So filtered water with fresh lemon juice. That's one of the easiest ways to alkalize your body. Just drink that throughout the day. So if you drink a cup of coffee, you, you have to you know kind of uh, balance things out. If you drink a beer or two, you have to balance things out that way. Lemon juice is also a way to alkalize. Um, and then, uh, vegetables <laughs> that's basically the primary thing is uh vegetables and in particular raw vegetables so that's why salad is such a great thing to eat especially at the end of the day you know that just allows your body overnight to become more alkaline uh and to you know take that inflammation down take any inflammation down i make a salad dressing of uh extra virgin olive oil uh breggs apple cider vinegar, um, lemon juice, and a little bit of black pepper. And that's also an alkalizing salad dressing. So when you throw that on your salad, um, it's just everything your body needs. So just wanted to add that, um, that there are some quick and easy ways to uh, do that. Baking soda is also really alkaline. Um, and so putting some baking soda in water and drinking that, that's often used as kind of a folk remedy for indigestion and, and acid reflux and stuff like that. Um, I, I don't like using baking soda as much as lemon juice just because it seems a little bit less natural and it almost seems a little bit salty or something. I don't know. There's something about baking soda that I only use occasionally. But anyway, those are quick tips on how to alkalize your body uh, and keeping your body alkaline is also keeping your body in a state where it can heal and where again like inflammation is brought down pain is brought down joint or tendon issues are uh kept at bay uh candida is not able to grow candida thrives in an acidic environment as well and if i find that if i eat a little bit too much meat or i um just kind of let up on the reins with the alkalizing let up on the reins with the lemon water or the vegetables that my candida symptoms kick in as well so just a hot tip to alkalize, alkalize, and then alkalize some more. Not too much, but you'll know what you'll know when your body feels good. <laughs>